everyone. Welcome to today's Friday Transportation Seminar. Today, Ana Maria Perez will speak about a no crash course in Vision Zero Data. My name is Teresa Somrak. I'm the Office and Events Coordinator at TREC, the Transportation Research and Education Center at Portland State University, and I will be moderating today's seminar. Our Friday Transportation Seminars have been a tradition since 2000, and peri periodically we partner up with Portland Bureau of Transportation to bring you special editions featuring guest speakers from PBOT. And that merges our seminar series with PBOT's longstanding Lunch and Learn series as well. So today we're going to be doing our first part of a two-part series on Vision Zero. And these seminars usually happen live on Portland State University's urban campus, in addition to being broadcast online. But of course, because of COVID-19, we will be doing today's seminar all online. Today, we're pleased to have Anna Maria Perez. She is a Vision Zero Data Analyst at PBOT. She holds a bachelor's in meteorology from San Jose State University and a master's in environmental management and a GIS certification from the University of San Francisco. At PBOT, she conducts crash and safety analysis to advance the Vision Zero program, supports planners and project managers on safety, and creates innovation around how PBOT thinks about data. But before jumping in right into our seminar, I'll let you know about a few upcoming events. On May 8th, we're gonna have Tammy Lee and Kristen Tufte from Portland State University presenting on creating and using a publicly available multimodal transportation data archive. And then on May 15th, Anna Maria's colleague, Matt Kelly, will be giving the second talk in this series about Vision Zero, speaking about how safe speeds save lives and how Portland is managing speeds for safety. And then on the 22nd, we will have John MacArthur and Aaron Golub from Portland State University presenting their research on understanding technology-based exclusion and emerging smart mobility systems. So I'll just give you an idea of what to expect from the seminar. Anna Maria is going to present for about 40 minutes, followed by a 15 minute Q&A. Um, then we will be recording today's seminar and it will be available on our website later. You will also receive the video recording and presentation slides and an email following the webinar in the next day or two. If you are tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. During the presentation, you may submit questions by using the questions pane on your control panel. And I'll keep track of your questions and Anna Maria will respond to them at the end of the webinar. If we run out of time and have more questions, I'll give Anna Maria the opportunity to respond via email later. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Anna Maria. Just give me a second to transition the presenter. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, where did that go? Uh, sorry, one second, I just had this and, okay, do you see the slideshow? Did that go okay? Yes, yes, we can see your slides now. Okay, great. Great. Um, okay, so uh, thank you, Teresa, for that introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And um, like she said, my name is Anna Maria Perez. I'm a data analyst at Vision Zero or um, on the Vision Zero team at PBOT. And I'm here to talk about um, what we're calling a, a no crash course in Vision Zero data. Okay, so a, a brief outline of my presentation today is I'll go over quickly a little Vision Zero 101. Then I'll talk about the Vision Zero Action Plan uh, from 2016. And then I'll go into what it means to be data-driven versus data-informed. I'll talk about some data limitations and how to stay aware of them. I'll share about some current Vision Zero projects. And then finally, a summary and closing. Okay, so Vision Zero in Portland is the city of Portland's commitment to eliminating traffic deaths and serious injuries. 
Uh, in June 2015, the Portland City Council unanimously passed a resolution committing Portland to Vision Zero. Uh, in December 2016, the City Council unanimously adopted the Vision Zero Action Plan. The Vision Zero Action Plan is the big picture of how Vision Zero would be implemented in Portland. And this uh, action plan answers the why, what, where, how, and who of Vision Zero. The why being that one death is too many, the what being the contributing factors in deadly and serious crashes, uh, the where the high crash network, or the where is the high crash network and where crashes happen, the how is the, are the action items outlined in the action plan and performance measures, and the who is the partners um, and the um, task force members who drafted the plan itself. And um, so this action plan is found great foundation for the work that we're doing today. And, um, and today we'll just focus on the what and the where. The where of Vision Zero is, um, mit, um, the majority is the high crash network. And the high crash network is compiled of 10 years of crash data, uh, where 57% of deadly crashes happen on about 30 corridors in the city. Uh, these 30 corridors only make up 8% uh, of Portland streets or about 200 miles. So on this map, uh, the high crash corridors are represented by the, or the orange lines. And these are our top 30 uh, corridors in the city where crashes happen most frequently. And uh, the circles, the orange circles on the map are the top 30 high crash intersections, which similarly are the intersections where we have the most severe and most crashes. And finally, the gray shaded areas on this map are uh, areas of higher densities of low income communities and communities of color. In addition to the citywide high crash network, we created three subset networks for three modes by the number of injuries. So the first, being motor vehicle occupants, we have a pedestrian high crash network and a bicycle high crash network. And if you're interested in looking at these graphics in more detail, they're in our Vision Zero Action Plan that's available on our website. The work behind the Vision Zero Action Plan also identified the top four contributing factors in deadly crashes. The first being street design, which we identified in our high crash network, these big wide streets with high posted speeds and high volumes. Um, speed is another significant contributing factor in deadly crashes where over 50% of crashes um, have speed are speed related. Uh, then impairment by drugs or alcohol is also a contributing factor. And then what we call dangerous behaviors, which can be um, anything from red light running or failing to yield to pedestrian or um, driving too fast for conditions. So in my daily work, I think about these contributing factors on different uh, geographic scales, such as citywide or a network like the high crash network, an area like the Lens Town Center urban renewal area, uh, a corridor or a segment like in support for a project, uh, or on an intersection level for various reasons. Now I wanna get into what it means to be data-driven versus data-informed. So my own definitions of what it means to be data-driven is that data-driven decision-making accepts data as the only input and data is seen as the ultimate truth. So an example of what this type of decision-making would be is that you take a number that was crunched in your data and you make a decision based on that one number without any further discussion or other inputs. Data-informed decision-making accepts data as a guiding input that supports further discussion. So in this, maybe you've done some data analysis and now you're taking this information to the table and you're uh, bringing in other, you're starting a discussion and you're um, bringing in other inputs and other considerations before making a decision. So, when I'm doing an analysis and I go, this is my process when I go through data informed, what I call data informed thinking. So the first is I ask myself, what is the question we're actually trying to answer? The second question I ask myself is, can the data we're using help to answer the question? And I remind myself to be skeptical at this point. And third, if this data can be helpful, what do we need to, what else do we need to consider? So the first question, what is the question you're actually trying to answer? 
I think of this as translating a statement into a research question. So um, I think, what am I really being asked to explore? And what is the, desi what is the desired outcome? Then I think about whether the data I'm using is helpful and fits uh, for this analysis. Does this data directly answer my research question? Was it created to answer this question? Or does it come from a different, um, does it serve a different purpose? And if, it, if this is the only data I have available, what are its limitations? And finally, what do I need to interpret and how should I prepare my analysis? Then if this data can be helpful, what else do we need to consider? Knowing these limitations in a data set, can we fill in gaps with other data sources? Do you have partners that maybe collect similar information or helpful information? How would this data set or how would this data best be communicated to the intended audience? After you look after you analyze data, you need to a big part about data analysis is how it's communicated. And finally, is there outside information that helps to explain why data looks this way? So when I think about, it's always important to think about data limitations because no data set is perfect for all of your needs. And the most important part about knowing what your data can do is knowing what it can't do. So some of the things you can consider when uh, thinking about data limitations are the time frame. Is this data too old or too recent for the analysis you're trying to do? Location and geography. Maybe you're looking at a citywide scale, but you only have countywide data. Completeness, are, you, are there missing values in, in your data? The data structure, is this uh, data format and structure useful for the tools that you're using in your analysis? The size of the data, is the data uh, too small of a sample or is it too big and thus too expensive to work with? Accessibility, do you have direct access to this data and you can um, obtain as much as you need on your own, or are you reliant on another source to, to provide it to you? Um, validation, has this data gone through any uh, quality assurance checks or quality inspections? Um, and finally, representativeness. This is especially important if you're looking at a population of people and you need to make sure that your data is representative of the actual population you're um, trying to analyze. So as an example, I'll talk about how crash data at PBOT works. So um, information on, we receive information on fatal crashes as they occur from the Portland Police Bureau, from our partners at the Portland Police Bureau. Um, but otherwise, the majority of our crash data comes from the official crash record at the Oregon Department of Transportation, or ODOT. Um, however, this data set is comprised of reported crashes only. So these are crashes that are either reported through self-reported through DMV or crash investigations reported through um, police, the police bureau and medical examiners. Um, and one caveat about this data is that it includes it only includes crashes that involved a motor vehicle. So for example, if a person on a bicycle crashes after getting stuck in the train tracks, that would not uh, that would not be included in the data. Similarly, if a person on a bicycle crashed into a pedestrian, that also wouldn't be considered a, a crash in this record, in this report. Um, and finally, these uh, these crashes are all coded to intersections um, for geographic purposes. So now here are some limitations of this data set that we work with. So the first is that there is a big lag in obtaining this official data set. The most recent data that we have is from um, the is through the end of 2017, and um, so we're about two years behind in data. Another limitation is that this is our primary is our primary data set. So if there's a lag, or it just makes these limitations more apparent because um, this is mostly what we work with. Um, as I mentioned, it's reported under it's. Um, this data set is reported crashes only, so an, uh, so we could say this is probably an underrepresentation of crashes because um, people have their own reasons for not wanting to report a crash, whether um, they walk away and the crash wasn't very severe and they they um, their injuries are pretty minor, or they just don't want to contact uh, uh, government or law enforcement. 
another limitation is that close calls are not captured. Um, close calls, uh, even though they're a huge risk factor, if there was no actual collision, this would not make it into the data set. And finally, some variables are not reliably measured, such as distraction and phone use. Again, because these are self-reported crashes in the more minor crashes, we, um, it is unlikely that people will report that they were doing something illegal when they crashed into, say, a parked car. Um, okay, so on the next slide, I just wanted to give this little warning that the following slides show images of vehicles involved in traffic crashes. Um, these are not graphic images, but it's just more of a, a, a trigger warning because, uh, and there's no imagery of uh, human injury or anything like that. So when I show these next two slides, I want you to think of which of these images shows a fatal crash. Is it this one? or this one. So we may be inclined to think that this crash resulted in a traffic fatality because this car looks totally destroyed, it's on its side, and the roof has been ripped off. However, we have records that show that a minor crash like this, a minor uh, fender bender with limited property damage, uh, has resulted in a traffic fatality. So keeping this in mind, um, how would these two example crashes show up in our major data set? So the crash on the left would show as property damage only. It would be a side swipe crash into a parked car. Two motor vehicles were involved, the vehicle that's on its side and the vehicle that was parked. Uh, speed was not a factor, impairment was not a factor, and it's on the high crash corridor. However, this crash on the right side shows um, that there was one death of a motor vehicle occupant. It was a rear end crash. Two motor vehicles were involved. Uh, speed was not a factor, impairment not a factor, and it was not on a high crash corridor. So the problem with this is that when we look on the, that, um, when we look at the crash on the left, we see it's a property damage only crash on a high crash corridor. We may be inclined to, um, to dismiss it and not include it in our analysis because uh, we don't actually see what the damage looked like. The crash on the right, we would probably focus on significantly because we see there was a fatality here. And be especially because it's not on a high crash corridor, we would wonder why this death happened. And this is just one example of how only looking at traffic fatalities does not tell the whole story about safety on Portland streets. So wait, 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 Anna Maria, you're telling me that this data is so flawed. Why would you use it? And you're right, that does seem um, like there's a lot of flaws with this data. It has so many limitations, but in reality, it's actually very detailed. And this is kind of an image, I couldn't even get an image of the whole data set but it is so detailed. There are over a hundred different variables in this data. And if we recognize these limitations and we stay aware of them, then we're gonna be okay. Okay, so now let's go back to thinking about our data informed thinking. What is the question you want to answer? Are you sharing crash history with the public? You're at a public meeting and you just wanna tell them what has happened in this area? Are you making an informed decision? Are you measuring performance or evaluating a recently completed project? Um, when you're thinking about, once you've decided what your question is and the purpose, you need to think about the audience. Are you presenting this to Portland City Council members or perhaps the director of the Bureau of Transportation? Or is it going to be, is this information that's going to be presented on a poster at a public open house where people will be um, reading this on their own? Or are you presenting this information to business owners where you'll be, uh, where you're hoping to install a, um, a new bike lane? So for each audience, you have to consider what is the right mat material for each of these audiences? Is it just talking points and numbers? Um, or simplified visualizations that will be displayed on a, a poster board? Or is this a spreadsheet to be shared internally and then used for further analysis? 
So now that we've thought about all of these, our data, data limitations, how to stay data informed and our audience, let's talk about, I would like to share some current Vision Zero projects. So the first uh, example that I'll go through is what I call the high crunch network segmentation. In this project, we just looked closer at each corridor. Um, the second example uh, I wanna talk about is automated enforcement and how do we select uh, new locations for cameras. And then finally, um, as a current event, COVID reporting is very important. And I wanna talk about how I had to get creative with some new sources of data and compare, make some apples to oranges comparisons. So the high crash network segmentation project started because uh, we have a range of corridor lengths, anywhere from two miles to 13 miles or more. Uh, we, so what I did was found that instead I would analyze these in quarter mile segments so that we can get a be better picture of what each quarter looks like. And the reason for this is because internal audiences wanted to know where should the next projects go? And how are crashes distributed along each high crash corridor? So thinking about our, our data informed uh, thinking process, uh, the question we, I got was, where should we do the next project on the high crash network? And my translation of this into a research question was, which segments on each high crash corridor have a higher frequency of crashes in the last five years? And it sounds a little bit of a mouthful, but here is the process. So I looked at the high crash network and cut them into quarter mile segments. Uh, the background is the end map of the whole of the whole network, but um, and then after after cutting them into quarter mile segments, I created maps for five different variables. The first being all crashes, so uh, all levels of injury for all modes, including property damage only. Then I also mapped pedestrian crashes at all levels of injury severity, bicycle crashes also at all levels of severity, motor vehicle crashes, fatal and serious injuries only, and then what we call vision zero focused crashes, which is the combination of those three. To reiterate what vision zero focused crashes are, they're just bicycle and pedestrian injury, or all levels of injury for bicyclists and pedestrians, and only deaths and serious injuries for motor vehicles, or crashes, I should say, crashes that resulted in deaths or serious injuries to uh, motor vehicle occupants. So this map is a Southeast Division Street, uh, or the Southeast Division Street High Crash Corridor cut into quarter mile segments. This High Crash Corridor extends from Southeast 12th Avenue all the way to Southeast 174th Place um, at the border of Gresham. And so this map shows all crashes that occurred on this corridor, uh, and that's what the shading in green represents. So uh, the darker areas, of, the darker shading of green represents higher frequencies of crashes. And so for each of the 30 high crash corridors, we created um, maps of, or we created similar maps for all 30 high crash corridors for the, uh, all crashes, pedestrian crashes, bicycle crashes and fatal and serious fatal and serious injury motor vehicle crashes and vision zero focus crashes but wait anna maria you told us not to focus on single numbers of crashes so why are you showing us these maps with the number of crashes on each segment now that's a good point but the focus of these maps isn't on the actual numbers themselves but how they are represented along the whole corridor. I also created, or so how they're represented along the whole corridor and how they relate to each other. So I also created an interactive web map where users can click on a particular segment if they wanna look closer and see the number of crashes that happen at that location after they've already focused on a particular area. But keep in mind that the purpose of these maps is not to see a segment that has six to eight crashes and then decide that there needs to be an intervention or a safety uh, project at that location. But this support, this, these maps are to support looking further and diving deeper into what it means. So in summary of the high crash network se segmentation project, um, 
I, using existing data, we we're able to create, create an easy to use visualization for each corridor. And by analyzing the high crash network in smaller segments, this shows more detail about a corridor. And these projects can be, or these maps can be used internally by planners to decide, um, to decide on future projects. Okay, so my next example on automated enforcement, uh, you may have heard automated enforcement called uh, photo enforcement, red light cameras, fixed speed cameras, but it all means the same thing. And so in Portland, uh, there are red light cameras, fixed speed cameras, which enforce speed on a segment, and mobile speed vans, which are deployed by the Portland Police Bureau and um, enforce speeding. So automated enforcement can be a little bit controversial. Um, one of the arguments is that because it takes photos of a driver, there are privacy concerns. However, there are significant safety benefits to uh, automated enforcement and they reduce a large portion a portion of crashes at intersections and along segments. And they also reduce the, the potential for racial profiling. So for my automated enforcement example, I wanna talk specifically about the red light cameras. For the red light camera extension pro expansion program, we have a limited number of locations, um, of new locations where we can put a camera. So we need to consider a few things. The first being ge geographic distribution and the equitable or and considering equ equity when we do this we need to look at crash histories where what are the areas where uh, red light running behavior and violations are prevalent and finally locations of known safety concern meaning the high crash intersections so um, okay so then we started with the question where should we put new red light cameras i've turned this into a question if we had a limited number of new red light cameras to place across the city, where would there be the greatest safety benefit? Our available crash data has information on crashes as a result of red light running. This ODOT crash data can provide the number of crashes that occur at intersections across the city. So we have that information. But because intersections are small locations, we need to increase the sample size to be able to identify trends. One way to do this is to include property damage only crashes. This is also beneficial because, uh, because the purpose of a red light camera is to prevent a dangerous behavior and not just a measure of severity. Although red light running behavior does um, more frequently lead to severe crashes. So when thinking about our limitations in this data set is that it only represents crashes where a driver ran a red light. Not every time a driver ran a, ran a red light. This means that it doesn't capture all of the incidents of red light running behavior, and thus is very likely an underrepresentation of the actual, um, the actual frequency of this uh, behavior. So how can we fill that in? Are there other data sources? Possibly. Other data sources that uh, other potential data sources to fill in these gaps on red light running behavior uh, can be sensors at traffic signals, uh, but those are not at every signal in Portland. Another data source can be police citation data, but that is also limited in accessibility and it only represents in instances when an officer was present. And finally, we really need to consider equity in this program because uh, considering the geographic distribution of potential cameras is, is very important to avoid uh, over-enforcing in areas that are already um, overburdened. So if we remember our high crash, uh, our high crash network map, um, most of the high, 28 of the 30 high crash intersections are, east, are either on 82nd Avenue or east of 82nd Avenue. Uh, we can also see that Many of the high crash corridors run the entire way through East Portland, and um, we have more areas of higher densities of low income communities and communities of color. And the purpose, the reason that this is important is over the purpose of the red light camera expansion program is not to overburden communities 
by uh, with traffic violations. So to talk a little bit about the process of how we selected locations, we start. I started by identifying signalized intersections with high with high frequencies of red light running crashes. Then I ranked the intersections by the number of occurrences. The top intersection only had 28 red light running crashes in five years. Well, I guess I shouldn't say only, but um, to give you a picture, that's a bit of a smaller number. Uh, then I created a list of a top, the top 100 out of about 1,800 signalized intersections that we have in the city of Portland. Uh, then we compared this to the high crash intersection list, found where we overlap. Um, with the, are any of the high crash intersections on this red light cap red light running list and then finally after review we reduce the list again to top 50 potential candidate locations so now that we've made all these lists now what does this tell us where red light cameras should be placed not really an intersection has vehicles entering and exiting at anywhere from two to four or more directions and each direction would need its own camera to enforce the behavior. And we call the direction that a vehicle enters an intersection the approach. So thinking about the approaching vehicle direction, um, here's an example of an intersection, um, not in the city of Portland. Um, and we can have, say this intersection has on our list, has made our list and it has eight red light running crashes. So but we don't know how that's distributed around the intersection and we can't exactly put four cameras here so some of the combinations could be an even distribution we can have a random distribution and we can also have a distribution just all of the crashes coming from one side or from one approach um, so now in a, an example here in Portland, uh, this is an intersection where two couplets meet in Southeast Portland. This is the Stark Washington couplet and the 102nd, 103rd uh, couplet. So uh, all of these, there are four intersections where these uh, streets meet and the white arrows show um, the direction of travel because these are all one way um, corridors. So when we just look at the number of crashes at um, each of these intersections and their approaches, um, we can show it in a table. And this table shows um, shows that information with a total bar on the far right, or a total column on the right-hand side. However, this is not a very compelling way to show this data. Um, trends are unclear, and it's difficult to even imagine where they are spatially. I can't see that map anymore. I, I don't know why there are blank spots in some places, and we see a lot of numbers like three and seven and one. Um, so it's not very compelling. So instead, I chose to make a visualization of these polar coordinate maps, or what I call a compass map. So these are um, a bird's eye view on top of each of these four intersections that we're looking at. and um, the wedges represent the approach direction of vehicles. So if a crash happened where the, the vehicle that ran the red light, uh, let's say we're looking at the top right example, um, we would see the wedge is large, or think of each wedge as an arrow pointing to the center of the intersection, and that's where it's coming into the intersection. So uh, the example on the top right, the intersection of uh, Stark and 103rd, shows that, um, or, oh, and the size of the wedge represents the proportion of crashes at that particular intersection uh, where the vehicles were entering, were approaching the intersection from that direction. So in that example at Stark and 103rd, we see the wedge is larger coming from the east rather than from the south, showing us that more of the red light cr running crashes are coming from the east. However, or so this is a pretty clear example, and it may also give us some more insight into potential errors. So let's look at this, uh, the intersection at Stark and 102nd Avenue. So we know all of the corridors are one way, and Stark, if Stark is a westbound or where westbound street where vehicles are coming from the east, 
why do we have a little wedge coming from the west when we know that vehicles are not coming from the west? This is an important note because um, when I looked closer at the data, there were three crashes that were shown as coming from the west. This could either have been a mistake this could have been that someone did turn and was driving the wrong way on this street. Maybe they turned out of a driveway and thought they were going uh, the correct way and didn't realize they're on a one way. I think, which is a pretty common um, mistake that people can have, especially when they're unfamiliar with an area. So keeping this in mind, um, this is easy. This is an easy error to see in the visualization. It's not an error in the data, but it's something that we know is incorrect. So if we were looking at this table, um, this was evident in the table, but not clearly an issue, unless you know that Stark on 102nd is a westbound street and it shouldn't have any, um, any vehicles coming from the west. So I think we'll stick to the, coordin the um, coordinate plots and use these as a better example. And so we did. And I created similar plots for, um, all of our candidate locations and uh, as shown on the following on this slide. So in summary of the red light camera approach direction analysis, uh, we made a complex topic into something understandable. Um, thinking about directions and intersections and not necessarily knowing how they're oriented or which, which ones have one ways or not. When you're looking at a, little, at a lot of intersections from 50 to 100, too many data points can be very overwhelming. And it's easier to have a visual representation where we can say, yes, we want to put a camera at this intersection. We're not going to put it in all four or five directions, but we can see the prevalent direction where this behavior may be happening. And finally, using visualizations was more effective at getting the point across when we shared it with some of our partners who are also involved in the program. So finally, I want to talk about COVID-19. Um, this pandemic has provided no shortage of data. Uh, we've all seen the flattening the curve uh, um, graphic. We've seen charts that show uh, COVID deaths by race in different states. Uh, the Oregon Health Authority has their own daily positive confirmed COVID cases. And the New York Times had this really effective graphic about the um, the unemployment rates in the United States. So everybody wants to know what's going on in terms of safety in Portland during during a pandemic. And so what I think they really want to know is, is the number of traffic crashes on Portland streets increasing or decreasing in response to statewide stay at home measures? So unfortunately, our usual data source from ODOT is not yet available for spring 2020. Like I said, we don't we only have data from uh, the latest from 2017. So what I did was I contacted my partners for potential data sources. I contacted uh, first responders. So we have partners at the Portland Fire and Rescue um, Bureau uh, Bureau and the Portland Police Bureau. And um, since they tend to go on the scene, um, at crashes, I thought they would be a good resource. And I was able to obtain some data from the Fire Bureau. However, this data is limited to only calls where Portland Fire and Rescue responded. So if they weren't called to the scene, this data set is probably going to be more conservative than our ODOT data, which many of those, um, many of those reported crashes come through DMV. And an additional limitation is injury severity information. We don't really have good data on that from this data set because um, this, this data set was not intended for that purpose. It was to report on calls. So there are crashes in this data set anywhere from just cleaning up a gasoline spill after a crash or for um, it could have been a fatality or a serious injury. So because this is uh, this is a data set that I was not familiar with. I still had to go through a learning process and I'm still going through that learning process. Um, this new Portland Fire and Rescue data is not directly comparable to our usual ODOT data set. And my learning experience with the ODOT data has been year, a years long process and now it's happening in real time with this new data. And so I need to keep it, I have to start from the ground up and keep in mind that 
definitions are different, variables are different, and information is grouped differently. But that doesn't mean it's not usable. Data sets that are optimized for other purposes, like the Fire Bureau, can still be useful for Vision Zero analysis. So here's an example of, of the results. After requesting a data uh, or data as far back as uh, January 1st, 2019, I was able to plot one whole year um, by week for, uh, for Portland Fire and Rescue calls to crashes. So whenever they respond to a call to a crash um, is represented in this data. So the blue line is all of the is every week in 2019. And so you can see it fluctuates around the average and the average weekly crash or number of calls to crashes is, is about 87. So uh, the orange line on the right hand side represents the same information, the calls to crashes in 2020. And we can see that um, the beginning of the year in the first few weeks of 2020, we were doing, it was our, our normal kind of fluctuating trend line but then all of a sudden in week, it looks like it's over week eight, but it's more like week nine or 10, we hit a peak and then just week over week, we see this strong decline. And so to summarize the information we got and what I guess what you could call the state of crashes in Portland right now is that responses to, to, to traffic crashes are below average. After calculating a five-year average of this data, I did find that March 2020 was about 25 to 30% less um, than the five-year average. Additionally, March 2020 had consecutive weekly decreases in response calls to crashes. So that means week by week, uh, every week in March had fewer response, had fewer calls to crashes than the week prior. And this is this is an unusual trend. It's not that it's never been seen before, and I have seen it happen, but it is pretty unusual and evident that people are probably travel that it is due to people traveling less. And finally, after six weeks, crash responses seem to have plateaued as of last week. However, it's too soon to make uh, an assumption like that, but there was just little change in the last two weeks. So in summary of my presentation, Vision Zero Portland uses data to inform a number of projects for different purposes and different audiences. People know Vision Zero as tracking fatalities and eliminating fatalities, and that is true, but we do a lot more work with data um, than just looking at the number of fatalities every year. And something that's very exciting about working on Vision Zero in Portland is that there's always, there's room for constant improvement and opportunities to develop new methods. Some of the examples I showed you today, to my knowledge, have not been done before. And so that's very exciting. And I'm really excited to um, continue to do innovative work here at the city. And finally, data alone does not make decisions. Data alone does not make policy, and data alone is not what will achieve Vision Zero. So to end it on a light note, I want to I want to close this out with a shout out to my uh, a quote from my high school pre calc teacher. Um, she taught me that when we were learning about using graphing calculators, she said, "Always be at least three percent smarter than the machine." And so what that means is even though your, your calculator or your uh, data analysis program, whether it's Excel or you know, GIS or R or whatever, recognize that the computer will do exactly what you want it to do. And so you as the human need to recognize when it's doing something wrong. And finally, I wanna give some acknowledgements to people that contributed to this uh, presentation and to me in general. Uh, so I want to give I want to thank Trek and PSU for inviting me to do this presentation, and um, also because I took a data analysis course with them last year. And so if anybody is watching from that class, um, my skills definitely played a role. The skills that I learned in that class definitely played a role in my analysis skills today. I want to give a shout out to Piba and Timo Forsberg for being the um, organizing and or organizing this presentation on. Uh, our end and a uh, shout out to my Portland Vision Zero team for always bearing with me when I have these uh, kind of scatterbrained thoughts, but really exciting work to do. 
and asking important questions. And I also want to thank my partners at Portland Fire and Rescue and Portland Police Bureau, because without them, we wouldn't have information on COVID and we would be lacking so much information about fatal investigations. And then finally, a shout out to all of my teachers, professors, and anyone who's inspired me up to this point. Thank you. And I'll now take questions. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Anna Maria, I'm going to put us both on the screen here. We do have sure. quite a few questions, okay. so I'll get through as many as I can, and then if there's extras, maybe we can uh, respond to those later. But sure. firstly, um, there, the first comment was somebody who was appreciating prioritizing streets for safety intervention and improvements. However, it seems to think that it has separated projects into Vision Zero and non-Vision Zero projects. For example, North Greeley, the current medium speeds are in excess of 55 miles per hour in each direction in a 35 mile per hour zone. And there's a project plan to widen the lanes a mother and daughter were killed on this road about a year ago, and when he asked Peabot why this was not being targeted for speed reduction, he was told that um, it was being funded by freight money and it was not a vision project, so safety concerns were not considered the same way. Can you speak to that at all? Um, so I can't really speak to that project that you're referring to. That would be more of a question either. I don't know the stage of that project um, that could be for a project manager on our team that may be better to answer that question but um but i hear you that there does seem to be a separation between what is a vision zero project and what's just a transportation project and that's a question about um, culture change as we're vision zero we encourage safe systems and the culture of safe system safe systems is still not very um is not I mean, in Vision Zero, we know it very well, and I think we're just trying to get everyone on board to share the same thinking. And that's part of the reason why um, I did the high crash network segmentation is to encourage that, you know, this resource is here. We've acknowledged safety, and we know there are some corridors that you haven't done a project or that we haven't done a project on. And so now here's a bit of a guide on where to start. Great, thank you. Um, next question is, um, are there con are, are the contributing factors for collisions ranked in any way? What percentage is impairment versus street design, would you say? Um, yeah, so we do have, we, we haven't like ranked them per se, like say one is more than the other, but they're all about 50% plus or minus a few percentage points. Um, as contributing factors in deadly crashes. And I didn't show the exact graphics today, but um, those exact percentage points are um, in the Vision Zero Action Plan. Okay, great. Um, if you could have one new data source, what would you want? <laughs> um, hmm. I guess thinking big picture, imaginary, I would love to be able to see close calls, uh, close call information, because that's a huge risk factor. And that would be such a better measure because sometimes, I don't know, it, I'm sure everyone listening in on this call has been, I don't know, walking around, biking around or driving around. And you say, whoa, that car almost hit me or, you know, someone almost hit me, but they didn't. And so instances of that, that can be due to visibility, that can be due to, you know, distraction, human behavior, whatever. But um, if we could see that this was a visibility problem or something that we can do as, a, as the city of Portland, then um, that would be huge if we can see that whole data set. And I'm sure our data set would like double or triple. So that cool. would be one of my dream um, data sets. Great. Um... What is the distribution of bicycle crashes in relation to severity? Wouldn't your maps look like there are very dangerous sections if the most bicycle crashes are minor injury or property damage only? Sorry, can you repeat the first part sure. of that? Sure. What is the distribution of bicycle crashes in relation to severity? Oh, okay. Like on any particular 
corridor. Um, I think that's what they're asking. Yeah, so um, that would probably be a next step in the segmentation project because um, right now, because sometimes the numbers are so small that it's like a number of like three. You know, I, I mean, I can name a handful of people I know personally who have kind of been like bumped by a car. Maybe they like scratched their arm and they're like, whatever, they just, you know, walked away and didn't report it. So it's not in the data, again, an underrepresentation. But um, so we could say it's probably underrepresentative of minor crashes. Um, I would say we'd have to look closer at what the actual distribution is. Um, but yes, we would be able to tell whether there are areas where there's higher severity versus lower severity of crashes. Great. Oh, we have so many great questions and not a lot of time. Let's see what I can. Um, fit in here. Um, so is it possible to get weekly cash, crash reports from the Portland Police Department? And if you could, a viewer would ask what type of crash is changing due to the current stay at home requirements? Um, that's a good question. Um, the way that um, the Police Bureau receives that information is a little bit different. So uh, there's they don't have access, basically they don't have access to crash reports immediately um, because they do go through some processing with their records department. And um, additionally, they respond to like thousands of crashes. In a normal time, there are thousands of crashes, hundreds of crashes a day. So in a week, uh, to give you an example of the scale, in a given year, there's about 5,000 injury crashes in Portland. So um, it's quite a quite a lot of information. So to get it on a weekly basis would be would be amazing, but it's very unlikely. And um, what crashes do I think are decreasing in times of COVID? I think um, a lot of I would guess that just because there are fewer cars on the road, we know our VMT is down, our vehicle miles traveled. That um, there are probably fewer of those like minor collisions where people are bumping into each other. Because if you just exam it, think about like in any space, if there are fewer things to crash into, you're going to crash less. However, um, I know the police bureau has been um, sharing on their social media that there is a lot of high speeding in Portland now that streets are pretty open. So with that information, I would suspect, again, just by logic and not based on the data I've seen, um, that any crash that does happen is probably more severe because it's two vehicles probably moving at a faster speed. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, on that note, let's see if I can find this question about AMPM. A viewer really appreciated your um, your wedge diagrams and mm -hmm. was wondering if there was an AMPM factor and that the peak hour might come contribute to understanding the location and size of each wedge? Uh, yeah, I didn't do that for this analysis in particular, but I have, or I didn't do that for these plots, but I have looked at time of day for those because we would guess that um, the later hours is are um, when these dangerous behaviors are happening because maybe you're sitting at a signal and no one's going through it. So you're just like, well, whatever, I'll just go through, right? Um, and the same thing for speeding because uh, the thing about red light running crashes or running a red light through an intersection is like, it's an imminent danger. So when there's all these vehicles speeding, you're, you're probably less likely to just run through that. But late at night, um, yeah, I would guess that you're probably, that um, the behavior is more prominent. Okay. Um, with coding intersections, how do you determine high crash rate mid-block driveways? Driveways are typically over 15% of all crashes and involve cr um, crossing bike lanes and sidewalks. Um, so for this analysis, I only looked at um, crashes, for the red light camera um, analysis, I only looked at crashes that were at an intersection. So I do hear you that they are, there are some coded as mid-block and, um, and driveway. So if it was coded to one of the candidate intersections, it was excluded from this analysis um, because it had nothing to do with the intersection itself. Okay. Um, what are some examples of qualitative sources to help inform data sets? Qualitative sources. Um, 
I guess uh, some data sets have comments in them or there's data that has demographics, which is also uh, really important for analysis. We don't have great information on de demographics, but that would be, um, I guess you could add that to my dream data sets as well. Okay, very cool. Um, it is 1230, but since we got started a little bit late, would you be mm -hmm. okay with um, answering a few more questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, and if people need to leave, I'm just going to uh, put up our more information slide here with the link to our other trainings and events. But I'll get back to our questions here. Mm -hmm. um, so what there's somebody was um, curious about specifically what tool or software you, allowed you or helped you to create those compass plots. Uh, yeah, so I use R and um, I, I write my scripts in R and R Studio, I guess. So oh, um, yeah, and there's like, a, it's part of the ggplot package if you're familiar with R. Cool. Uh, um, what is the average number of fatalities or serious injuries each year and has this gone down since Denver completed the Vision Zero Action Plan when it was completed? Did you say since Denver? Yeah, I'm not sure why Marty is asking about Denver, but I, I think there's some questions that are comparing Portland's Vision Zero to Vision Zero initiatives in other places. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see if she's gotten back to me. Um, oh, she meant she meant Portland. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> maybe she's in Denver. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah. I think she might be in Denver. So what um has the average number gone down since so, it was created? Um. So since Vision Zero is still pretty young, and we haven't been able to do really big interventive projects yet, we are getting a lot on, or we had plans to get a lot on the ground this year. And hopefully those can still go through despite COVID. Um, but um, so we really, since the action plan was adopted at the end of 2016, we really only have 2017, 18, and 19. So it's hard to say with so few numbers. And these numbers are quite small and have fluctuated year over year. But what we have seen in the last three years is a decrease in um, serious injuries overall, which is really encouraging because I think a lot of times when we think of Vision Zero, we think of fatalities, but the goal of Vision Zero is also to eliminate serious injuries. So um, that's showing a little bit more of a trend because typically see, we see a few hundred serious injury crashes on our streets instead of um, under 100. Okay, another question about uh, Vision Zero and, and kind of comparing to other places. Does people at Vision Zero have a, have a partnership with the local health department like San Francisco Vision Zero does? So San Francisco Vision Zero is very lucky and I want to connect with them a little more because uh, the city and the county is the same entity down there. And um, so they have access to um, public health data on a county level, which is the same as city level for them. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that specific or of uh, information, but we do partner with, we do have partners at the Multnomah County Public Health Department who um, give us um, uh, some, give us information on injuries at a county level. And they can tell us if it's increasing or decreasing based on, um, you know, clinics and hospitalizations. Okay, we all, we've got a lot of thank yous and a happy birthday. Is it your birthday oh. today? <laughs> oh, it's tomorrow. Oh, happy so. early birthday. We're so pleased to have you. Um, I'll just you. do one more question and then okay. we'll wrap up and I'll give you a chance to, to answer these later. Okay. Uh, sure. So it sounds like regionally Clackamas, Multnomah, um, Originally, Clackamas, Multnomah, and Washington counties, um, the fatal crashes have gone down by about half as the fatal as as has a fatal crash rate. And I think he's talking about during the COVID time. Has Piedmont analyzed fatal crash rates for March to April compared to previous years? Um, it's hard to say because 
April 2019 was a, a bad year for fatalities in Portland streets. Um, we had over 10 fatalities or 10 fatalities on our streets. And um, that was a really challenging time. And this year in April so far, we're at the 24th and we've had one. So it's to me, that's a tough comparison to compare to last year because there's nothing about April, the month itself, that makes more fatalities happen, if that makes sense. So it, the most, I would say that the most we could say is on a seasonal level, we could say like summertime, we do see increases because more people are out. Um, during the winter time, um, it's kind of the holidays, so more people are having a little fun, you know, maybe uh, more impairment. And so um, we have looked at previous years, but it's hard to say if month to month, or it's hard to make a conclusion from that. I could give you numbers, but it really, it wouldn't come to a reasonable answer. That makes sense. Great. Well, thank you so much, Anna Maria. It was a pleasure having you today. And Yeah, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Good. Uh, okay. Yeah, we've got tons <laughs> of, of just compliments in our question box. So oh, awesome. that concludes our talk. Thank you again. And if people are interested in any professional development offerings in the future, our website at trek.pdx.edu is where you can find those. And hope everybody enjoys the rest of your day. Once you close the seminar, there'll be a little pop-up survey. It just takes a couple of seconds if you want to fill that out for us. So thanks, everyone. Happy birthday, Anna Maria. Oh, thank you. Bye. <laughs> okay, bye.